This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. I'm Mark Trahant, and welcome to the ICT Newscast. Today, in this special edition, we are examining the presidency, popular culture, and indigenous people. Take Teddy Roosevelt. There he is, smiling on the side of a building in Phoenix. It's a statement about popular culture. Teddy the teddy bear, Teddy the iconoclast, and Teddy the cowboy. Of course, the story for native people is a darker one. Take his praise of the cowboy. He said in a speech in 1858, I don't go so far as to think that the only good Indian is the dead Indian. But I believe nine out of every 10 are, and I shouldn't inquire too closely into the case of the 10th. The most vicious cowboy has more moral principle than the average Indian. Take 300 low families of New York and New Jersey, support them for 50 years in vicious idleness, and you will have some idea of what Indians are. Reckless, revengeful, fiendishly cruel. Cruel is an ironic word. That same year, Roosevelt praised the Sand Creek Massacre as, on the whole, a righteous and beneficial a deed as ever took place on the frontier. Cruel as in the murder of more than a hundred Cheyenne and Arapaho people on the plains of Colorado. A few years ago, I had my own encounter with a president I was given the opportunity to ask President George W. Bush a question at a convention that included the Native American Journalists Association. I wanted to ask something that the president could answer, something unique just for him. This is what I came up with. My name is Mark Trahant. I'm the editorial page editor of the Seattle Post-Intelligencer and a member of the Native American Journalists Association. Most school kids learn about government in the context of city, county, state, and federal. And of course, tribal governments are not part of that at all. Mr. President, you've been a governor and a president, so you have a unique experience looking at it from two directions. What do you think tribal sovereignty means in the, tri in the 21st century? And how do we resolve conflicts between tribes and the federal and state governments? Yeah. Uh, tribal sovereignty means that. It's sovereign. I mean, it's, you, you're a... You're a You've been given sovereignty, and you're viewed as a sovereign entity. Okay. And therefore, the relationship between the federal government and tribes is one between sovereign entities. Now, the federal government has got a responsibility on matters like education and security to help, and health care. And it's a solemn duty. And from this perspective, we must continue to uphold that duty. Um, I think that one of the most promising areas of all is to help with economic development. And that means helping people understand what it means to start a business. That's why the Small Business Administrations increase loans. Uh, it means, obviously, uh, encouraging capital flows. But none of that will happen unless the education systems flourish and are strong, and that's why I told you we've spent $1.1 billion in the reconstruction of uh, uh, Native American schools. What does it mean when a president is stumped by the question? More than that, if a president understands or misunderstands the role of treaties and tribal governments, then how will that filter down to the rest of the political system? President Bush is not the only president to get confused about Indian policy. Mr. President, I heard that a group of American Indians have come here because they couldn't meet you uh, 
in the United States of America. If uh, you fail to meet them here, will you be able to improve, to correct it, and to meet them back in the United States? I didn't know that they had asked to see me, if, if they've come here, or whether to see them there. I'd be, I'd be very happy to see them. Uh, let me tell you just a little something about the American Indian in our land. We have provided millions of acres of land for what are called the preservations, or the reservations, I should say. They, they from the beginning, announced that they wanted to maintain their way of life, as they had always lived there in the desert and the plains and so forth. And we set up these reservations so they could and have a Bureau of Indian Affairs to help take care of them. At the same time, we provide education for them, schools on the reservations. And they are free also to leave the reservations and be American citizens among the rest of us, and many do. Some still prefer, however, that way of, that early way of life. And we've done everything we can to meet their demands as to what they how they want to live. Uh, maybe we made a mistake. Maybe we should not have humored them in, in that wanting to stay in that kind of primitive lifestyle. Maybe we should have said, no, come join us, be citizens, uh, along with the rest of us. As I say, many have, many have been very successful. And uh, I'm very pleased to, to meet with them, talk with them at any time, and see what their grievances are or what they feel they might be. Uh, you'd be surprised. Uh, some of them became very wealthy because some of those reservations uh, were overlaying great pools of oil. And you can get very rich pumping oil. And uh, so I don't know what their complaint might be. Reagan was caught off guard. He clearly didn't expect such a question especially in Moscow. Then a century ago, any president would have spent a lot more time on Indian issues. There were always conflicts involving land, water, and the appointment of the federal government's Indian commissioner. The commissioner and Indian agents were much sought after jobs because they represented a certain path for humble civil servants to get rich, working on a reservation determining which company got contracts, trees, or even fish was an open door to, well, let's just say, profits. President's Day has its roots in the celebration of two presidents, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, two complicated histories. Washington recognized the treaty process itself. In a message to Congress, Washington wrote, the general government only has the power to treat with the Indian nations, and any treaty formed and withheld without its authority will not be binding. Washington even directly negotiated treaties, including the 1790 Treaty of New York between the U.S. and Muscogee nations. Dinner was a technique for Washington. The first president often invited tribal delegations to his home both in Philadelphia, which was then the capital city, and at Mount Vernon, according to the historian Callan Colloway, author of The Indian World of George Washington. In his first term in office, Washington dined more often than once with Mohawks, Senecas, Oneidas, Cherokees, Chickasaws, and Creeks, Callaway wrote, and he continued to dine with Indian delegates to the very end of his presidency. In the last week of November 1796, he dined with four groups of Indians on four different days. When the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian opened up its treaty exhibit, it included one actually signed by George Washington. Suzanne Harjo, who curated the exhibit, explained on a panel the significance of Washington and his direct involvement. Muscogee Treaty of 1790 with George Washington, they knew each other. I mean, the Muscogee delegates had dinner with, with George Washington at his home. And John Trumbull was there, and he had just finished painting the iconic painting of of George Washington in his military outfit, and George Washington wanted to play a joke on, on the Muscogee delegate, so he had Trumbull set up the painting, and then Washington opened a door, and here he was standing next to himself. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> now, as you never think of, of George Washington as having a sense of humor. That's, <laughs> right, that's for sure. <laughs> and even as corny a sense of humor as that is, <laughs> it's still a sweet, charming sense of humor. And he was trying to communicate across, I mean, he didn't speak Muscogee, and one of them, the head of delegation, did speak English, and some of the others did, but they were talking mostly in Muscogee. He was speaking in English. They had a translator. But this was his way of communicating directly with them and saying, look at me and look at me. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that's pretty wonderful. They loved it. The Muscogee delegates loved it so much that they made a ceremony for it and changed the name wow. of, a, of a tribal town, a daughter town to Hickory Ground. Uh, there are two that had the same name, and they changed it to Nyaka. Now, you may think that that's a beautiful Muscogee word, but no. It, it is now a Muscogee word because it's our tribal town, but it's the sound that they heard when they heard New York. New York. <laughs> New York. <laughs> so it's New York tribal town. New York, which, New York. <laughs> which is in Oklahoma, you can see it. There's a New Yorker mall, a country store. I just, I think of George Washington as the first selfie. You know, he's yes. just <laughs> standing there That's next to his own <laughs> picture, his own painting. John Quincy Adams, like Washington, had a keen interest in working with indigenous people. Adams tried to stop Georgia from harassing the Muscogee people who were being pressured by the state's governor to give up their lands. Some Muscogee agreed to concessions, but Adams did not go along. He declared the treaty null and void. In a second treaty, the 1826 Treaty of Washington, Adams and the tribal leaders reached a less one-sided pact. Adams' victory did not last long. He gave in to the Georgians because he was afraid of a civil war. Nonetheless, Adams remained a critic of the U.S. policy he was not opposed to Indian removal from lands in the southeastern United States, but he argued that the treaty had to be upheld and lands could not be taken without consent. Abraham Lincoln perhaps was the most complicated of the American presidents. Lincoln did not execute any generals or other top Civil War leaders for treason or insurrection against the United States. Yet, on December 26, 1862, he ordered the death of 38 Dakotas by hanging in Mankato, Minnesota. After a short war where Dakota warriors attacked white villages trying to get food for their family, the army gave Lincoln a list of 304 people that had been sentenced to death by execution. The president went through the list, striking off many names, leaving only 38. This was not a fair trial or any other judicial proceedings. Most of those arrested and charged did not speak English, let alone have legal counsel. The Dakotas who were hung represent the largest mass execution in U.S. history. Lincoln was also a champion of Western expansion, promoting the Transcontinental Railroad as a way to consolidate civilization. Tribal people were in the way. Then there's this other Lincoln story. Spain's king had sent symbolic canes to the Pueblos as a recognition of sovereignty. At the urging of the U.S. government's agents to the Pueblos, Michael Steck, 19 ebony canes with silver tips inscribed A. Lincoln were presented to the Pueblo governors. Later, the symbolism of those canes, the Pueblo canes, was not lost on Richard Nixon. Nixon had put the weight of his presidency behind the return of Taos Pueblo, land taken by the U.S. Forest Service in 1906. The meeting was in the cabinet room. As Bobby Kilberg, then a White House fellow, told me, that room was only for cabinet meetings, for governors, for heads of states. See, Nixon saw tribal leaders as heads of states, so much so that he sent a cane, like Lincoln's, to the Taos leadership. Nixon's accomplishments included the return of Blue Lake and his presidential message rejecting termination and instead recognizing self-determination. The Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act was the legal definition of that policy. The Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act, which some call the last major treaty, was also completed in the Nixon years. It was during the administration of Gerald Ford, however, that the Indian Health Care Improvement Act was signed into law. 
The new White House staff even suggested Ford break from Nixon and veto the message. A physician in the White House, Dr. Ted Mars, pleaded with the president to do the right thing. President Gerald R. Ford wrote on October 1st, 1976, I am signing S-522, the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. This bill is not without its faults, but after personal review, I have decided that the well-documented needs for improvement in Indian health, manpower, services, and facilities outweighs the defects in the bill. I'm signing this bill because of my own conviction that our first Americans should not be last in opportunity. President Barack Obama would pretty much own any presidential list of moments because his presence was more significant than any president since Washington's dinners. The story starts with candidate Obama when he made a promise at Crow Agency in 2008 to initiate a government-to-government -government meeting at the White House. President Obama made more visits to indigenous communities than any other president. In addition to his visit to Crow Agency, he also went to Standing Rock in June of 2014. People of Standing Rock, people of Indian Country, Michelle and I are so honored to be in this sacred and beautiful place. It's easy to see why it's called God's Country. And because I'm among friends, uh, I'm going to try something in Lakota. But, you know, I can't guarantee it's going to come out perfect. How me dako yepi? I'm going to practice. I'm going to be even better next time. You know, when I was first running for president, uh, I had the honor of visiting the Crow Nation in Montana. And today I'm proud to be making my first trip to Indian Country as President of the United States. I know that throughout history, the United States often didn't give the nation-to-nation -nation relationship the respect that it deserved. So I promised, when I ran, to be a president who changed that. A president who honors our sacred trust and who respects your sovereignty and who upholds treaty obligations and who works with you in a spirit of true partnership and mutual respect to give our children the future that they deserve. And today I'm proud that the government-to-government -government relationship between Washington and tribal nations is stronger than ever. You see, my administration is determined to partner with tribes. And it's not something that just happens once in a while. It takes place every day on just about every issue that touches your lives. And that's what real nation-to-nation -nation partnerships look like. But I realize that a powwow isn't just about celebrating the past. It's also about looking to the future. It's about keeping sacred traditions alive for the next generation, for these beautiful children. So here today, I want to focus on the work that lies ahead. And I think we can follow the lead of Standing Rock's most famous resident, Chief Sitting Bull. He said, let's put our minds together to see what we can build for our children. So let's put our minds together. In September 2015, Obama made a trip to Alaska, and it's the first presidential visit above the Arctic Circle. He talked about climate change and visited with Alaska Native leaders, elders, and young people. Most presidents failed badly when it came to fair dealings with indigenous people. Thomas Jefferson was a contradiction. His vision was a country that was a garden of boundless fertility and a republic that was free in his rough draft of the Declaration of Independence, he wrote, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with inherent and certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Then, just a few paragraphs later, Jefferson complained about British rule because the king has excited domestic insurrection among us and has endeavored to bring 
on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions of existence. This was the Jefferson who would dig up indigenous human remains in the name of science, the Jefferson who owned and raped human beings, the Jefferson who had a contempt for a world he did not understand. Jefferson should also get credit as being the architect for one of the most brutal chapters in American history, Indian removal. Long before Andrew Jackson, Jefferson wrote in 1776 that the only resolution between settlers and the Cherokee Nation was genocide. Nothing will reduce those wretches so soon as pushing war into the heart of the country. But I would not stop there, he wrote. I would never cease pursuing them while one of them remained on this side of the Mississippi. As president, Jefferson's official policy was the preservation of peace and obtaining lands. After all, he did grow up in a real estate family. Andrew Jackson took Jefferson's ideas literally. Quick fact, Jackson is the first American president to be photographed. There is another story. Andrew Jackson's life was saved by Cherokee warriors in the Battle of Horseshoe Bend in 1814. And Jackson was personally close to many of the Cherokee leaders, including Major Ridge and John Ross. Many of them visited Jackson's home, the Hermitage, often. Jackson adopted a young Cherokee boy, Lincoa, and was distraught when he died of illness at a young age. Yet Andrew Jackson ignored a Supreme Court decision and ordered the removal of the Cherokee. He used the State of the Union in 1828 to make it clear he was taking Georgia's side over the Cherokee Nation. And just to make certain that the message was clear, Jackson ticked off other states where he thought the tribal interest should be subservient. The president wrote, Would the people of Maine permit the Penobscot tribe to erect an independent government within their state? And unless they did, would it not be the duty of the general government to support them in resisting such measure? Would the people of New York permit each remnant of the six nations within her border to declare itself an independent people under the protection of the United States? Could the Indians establish a separate republic on each of their reservations in Ohio? And if they were so disposed, would it be the duty of this government to protect them in that attempt? He told Congress that he informed the Indians that tribal self-government would not be permitted and advised them to immigrate beyond the Mississippi. That would be to the Indian Territory, later the Twin Territories, now Oklahoma. And thousands of people died on that tragic highway, the Trail of Tears. Several presidents have visited tribal communities. President Chester Arthur was likely the first one to formally visit a tribal nation. He traveled to Wind River, Wyoming in 1883 during a two-month fishing trip. This trip could have gone badly. The president and his delegation met with Chief Washakie, Eastern Shoshone, and Chief Black Colt, Northern Arapaho, to talk about a proposal in the Senate for an early version of termination and dividing up the reservation into tenure in common or private ownership. The response from Wind River was an unequivocal no. Warren Harding was the first president to visit Alaska in 1923, stopping at Metlakatla. Calvin Coolidge signed the Citizenship Act in 1924, making American Indian citizens, really. But this law was enacted in the name of assimilation, not Indian rights. Franklin Roosevelt visited at least three reservations, only once speaking on Indian affairs. He traveled to Quinault in Washington State, Blackfeet, Montana, and Cherokee, North Carolina. He was also photographed with a tribal leader in North Dakota. Harry S. Truman was president when he stopped on the Fort Peck Reservation in 1952 as part of his whistle stop campaign. He was met by Assiniboine leaders. He was given a pipe to smoke. Montana Representative Mike Mansfield, who was also on the platform, told the Indians, the president doesn't smoke. What he did here was for the first time. President Bill Clinton was the first president to invite lots of tribal leaders to the White House. On April 29, 1994, he said, My administration has worked in partnership with tribal leaders to protect American Indian religious freedom, promote tribal self-determination, preserve tribal natural resources, and provide economic opportunities for Native Americans. 
I look forward to continuing this government to government relationship in order to build on the progress we have made in Indian country. Clinton also made two presidential trips, one to Pine Ridge and another to Shiprock. Ronald Reagan went to Albuquerque, New Mexico to meet tribal leaders in 1985. One extraordinary meeting was in the presidential suite at the Hilton where Reagan, Ivan Sidney, and Peterson Saw talked about the Navajo Hopi dispute. Presidential trivia, President Herbert Hoover lived as a child in Pahuska, Oklahoma. He wrote in a letter, I attended school with my Indians appropriate to my size. They were, of course, being taught English. I and my cousins were mostly interested in learning Osage. At least two presidents can claim adoption. Calvin Coolidge in 1927 by Chauncey Yellowrobe, Sikangu, in Deadwood, South Dakota, and President Obama by Hartford Sonny Black Eagle Jr., Crow Nation. That's a slice of our indigenous world and a bit of history. For the latest news, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.